You're listening to an Ono Media podcast. Good morning, and thanks for joining me for Rise and Crime, your morning caffeine hit all about crime. I'm Mama Jules, and today I've got several smaller stories for you, because sometimes the breaking true crime isn't about seven-week trials with a verdict to explore. Sometimes we just have to look at the quirky and the strange. So buckle up, because I have some weird ones for you. And let's start with a shout out to Garrett Moreland, my son-in-law. He's over at Murder With My Husband. If you're a fan of Peyton and Garrett, you know that Garrett has had his fair share of run-ins with the HOA board members in a couple of different neighborhoods that the two have lived in. His biggest offense in the first neighborhood was leaving his trash can on the street after it had been emptied. And his most recent offense, well, he was repairing a deck in his backyard without getting HOA approval. In this viral video, out of Tennessee, TikTok users have dubbed the grumpy old man in the video HOA Larry. So I'm going to call him Larry as I tell you the story about two kids who pushed all of Larry's HOA buttons over the July 4th holiday in America. Now, this video has nearly a million likes and was posted by one of the two boys after the almost physical altercation, absolutely verbal altercation, that happened at a fishing pond. Okay, I'll play the video here in a second, but let me set some things up. Larry, who's wearing khaki shorts and a green t-shirt that says Tennessee Strong across the front, well, he approaches two young boys fishing in a pond in an affluent neighborhood. Now, the man believes the boys are trespassing on what he calls private property. He orders them to leave the area. Then he threatens that he's going to throw their phones, which they're using to video his aggressive behavior. Well, he says he's going to throw those phones into the pond. And the boys say they're waiting for the police to arrive in order to just settle the dispute. Here, just give it a watch and a listen. No, don't touch my rod. Don't Touch my rod. No, passing on private property. Don't threaten us. You're trespassing on don't private us. property, young man. We're waiting for the police to come. You don't need to get out of here. No, wait for the leave. no, we're going to talk to leave. them. Leave. We're going to talk to them. You threatened us. He's our president. You threatened us. You threatened us. You want that phone to go in the lake, young man? He's on the boat. You threatened us. <laughs> you want that phone to go in the lake? Back away Walk from here, boys. Back Walk away out of here. Back up. Don't test me. Back up from me. Back up from me. Get out of here. Back up from me. How'd I take that phone? And put it in the lake. Yeah, now press charges. For what? Like assault? What? For what? Assault? Yeah, I'm not assaulting you. Get out of here. We're just gonna wait. We're not gonna mess with anything. Get out of here. We're You're fishing in a private lake. Get the hell out of here now. The cops are coming. We're just waiting for them. Okay, good. Yeah, we're waiting for them. We're, you we're know what? We're gonna prosecute. Them. So your parents are gonna be real proud of that. All right. We're gonna prosecute you, and you're gonna pay all kinds of money because you're being a. I'm not being a. Sir, you're the no, one yelling. You're, going, you're on you're private get... property, Sir, young man. I'm just get trying to fish. Here. You threatened us and you walked up. Get out of here. You're on private property. Get out of here. Don't, we're, don't we're, touch we're, me. We just said we wanted to win. You touched me earlier. Get out of here. You touched get me earlier. Get out of here. You touched me earlier. <laughs> just your parents. Wait till I get a hold of your parents. I'll call them. Give me your call them right Let's now. Call My phone's dead. Call them. You call them. I don't call feel like it. I just talked to the police. I'm going to just talk to the police. You don't even know their number. You live in. Your parents live in this neighborhood? Don't worry about that. Hey, listen, he knows everybody. He said, he, he said, he said, he said did, his but last name Smith. Lying. Do you know any Smith lives in here? No. Okay, so what's your real name, buddy? I'm not telling. I'll, I'll tell the police that. I'm not telling y'all that. Wait, 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 what's you the problem? Don't live in here. Okay, we're, we're just going to wait till the police. He knows everybody. We're waiting lives for the police. He's the president. He's lived here for years. And there's no Smith that lives in here. We can stop fishing, but like we're just going to wait for the police. You don't live in here. We're going to wait for the police to be here. Every family in here. We're just going to wait for the police. Where you guys from, man? Tennessee. Tennessee. Will your parents be proud of you? Why don't you send me that video? I'll send them and show you what a fine young man they're raising. Uh, and yeah, you're, what a yeah, fine young man they're raising. You pressing up on some fifteen-year-old boys. Yeah, why are you pressing on fifteen-year-olds? Now, hopefully, we got all the colorful language edited out of that. And if you notice, Larry gets dangerously close to bumping the one young man. And he does cause damage to the fishing rod. In fact, he snapped the $200 rod in half. So let's walk through this mess because I think listeners could argue both sides here. Okay, first off, who's the adult? I always believe when dealing with youth, even if they're being maybe a little stupid or reckless, 
adults need to remember who the grown-up is in the situation. And I'm pretty disappointed with the grown man here. HOA Larry kind of loses his cool. Second, no matter what, he should have never broken the fishing pole. That's a bad move on Larry's part. All right, third, Larry, this one's to you. You missed an opportunity to be a mentor. These boys are actually kind of calm and quite reasonable. Meet them where they are and teach instead of threaten. You know, maybe talk to them about, hey, you guys are on private property, but let's work out a deal. I don't care you're fishing here, but let's earn your keep. Maybe help clean up the neighborhood or whatever, but be a mentor. Don't be someone who threatens people younger than you. Now, fourth, this one's to the boys. Did you have permission? I mean, that's not clarified in any reporting that I found, but it is vital to the story. If these boys didn't get permission, they need to learn from this and move forward. You should always ask for permission. And then fifth, all those voices of the other neighbors in the background, I couldn't get any of them to calm down Larry. I'm like sitting there going, please help him out. Instead, they're just egging him on. They don't help him de-escalate the situation. I'm sure I've missed plenty in analyzing this situation, but one comment that kept surfacing as the video went viral was that adults are always lamenting that kids spend all their time in front of the phone screens or maybe watching too much Netflix or playing too many video games. And here, Larry gets so frustrated at some boys that are outdoors. They're learning a skill. They're enjoying an activity that doesn't include technology. Now, I get those people who express that. Tell me what you think. Did HOA Larry go too far? I'm pretty sure Garrett would say yes. And since we mentioned the 4th of July, let's talk about this story out of South Carolina. Block parties or neighborhood private fireworks shows. You guys, that's just a staple in America on the 4th of July. Kids will be gathered as the dads live their best pyromaniac dreams and they light hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars of fireworks for the whole entire neighborhood to enjoy. Except in this story... 41-year-old Alan McGrew mixed alcohol with his pyrotechnic show, and it turned deadly. Alan's wife, Paige, said that Alan began drinking at about 6 o'clock on the night of the 4th. Then when darkness fell, the fireworks started, and Alan, who was wearing an Uncle Sam-type top hat, well, he was really putting on a show, being the life of the party. Paige watched Alan place a large firework on top of his head, kind of nestled down into that top hat? Well, Paige begged Alan to stop, but her pleas went unheard because Alan had already lit the firework and it exploded on top of his head. Immediately, Alan collapsed and EMTs were called, but Alan was pronounced dead in the middle of the road. His massive head wound was untreatable. Paige went on to tell the Post and Courier that her husband wasn't a regular drinker, but that Independence Day was his favorite holiday. It was the day he'd kind of cut loose. And Alan, well, he has one adult son and was employed as an HVAC worker. Paige said he was a patriot who was proud of his son. And that son had just gotten engaged to be married. Now, recommended practices from the National Safety Council encourage people to wear eye protection, other things, including don't use fireworks while intoxicated, The advice also recommends not to hold lit fireworks in your hands. I think that could be extended to not place lit fireworks on any part of your body. Now, my heart just goes out to Paige. I hope she can find peace in such a senseless accident. Alan's memorial is being held on the day this podcast drops. If you're the praying sort, it might be nice to include Paige in those prayers. And to another short story, but interesting nonetheless, the Colorado property where Chris Watts murdered his pregnant wife and his two young daughters, well, it appears to have been sold. Okay, if you don't remember the story, well, back in August of 2018, at about 2 a.m., Shannon Watts was dropped off at her Frederick, Colorado home. She'd been on a business trip and was returning late. And the next day, that friend tried to reach Shannon by phone. She didn't answer. And then the pregnant Shannon missed her OBGYN appointment, and that was too far for her friend. So the police were called, and so was her husband, Chris Watts. For three days, 
There was no sign of Shannon and her two daughters, three-year-old Celeste and four-year-old Bella. And Chris kept changing his story. Detectives kind of just had that itch, that instinct, that Chris was not being truthful. Pretty quickly, they discovered Chris was having an affair with one of his co-workers. And Chris also failed a polygraph. After those results of the failed polygraph were presented to Chris, well, he was feeling the heat. And he asked for one thing from investigators. He wanted to talk to his dad. And that's who Chris eventually confessed to. He told his father the bodies of his wife and two daughters were located at the Anadarko Petroleum site where Chris worked. And at first, his confession included the detail that Shan Ann killed the two girls by smothering them. And then Chris said that he, in a fit of rage, strangled Shan Ann. But two months later, he changed his confession and finally told investigators after he went to prison that he had gotten in a fight with Shannon when she came home that night. That fight led to him strangling Shannon. Chris said while he was trying to transport Shannon's body down the stairs and out of the house, that Bella and Celeste woke up. Well, he loaded the girls into their car seats and placed his wife's body on the floor of the truck at his children's feet. And then he drove to his job site. There, he smothered the girls and then disposed of all three bodies. Now, his guilty plea landed Chris in a Wisconsin prison serving life sentences. And all of that, remember, back in 2018. Well, finally, in 2024, in April, the house was put on the market for $775,000. When there wasn't much movement, the price was dropped to $750,000. And on July 3rd, it was put under contract. The five-bed, four-bath home has 4,177 square feet, and it was featured prominently in the 2020 Netflix documentary, American Murder, The Family Next Door. All right, so my big question, who gets the money from the cell? Well, Chris defaulted on the mortgage following the murders, and eventually the lender foreclosed on the property. His debt became even bigger after he was ordered to pay Shannon's parents $6 million as part of a wrongful death lawsuit. So I'm guessing the bank is profiting off the cell. Shannon's brother told People Magazine that growing up, he viewed Shannon as the perfect role model. He said she had lots of friends and was very popular. He also said Shannon was born to be a mother and was working diligently to provide a great life for her two daughters and her unborn son. And this got me thinking and doing a little research, which then landed me on a Newsweek page. And Newsweek answered some of the questions that you might be having jointly with me, asking about what do you do when you sell a property that is infamous for murders committed there? Well, there's lots of answers. Sometimes selling's not an option. For instance, the apartment building where Jeffrey Dahmer tortured and dismembered his victims, and then eventually he ate several of his victims. Well, that building couldn't be sold and was finally demolished. And then some properties are monetized, like the Lizzie Borden house in Fall River, Massachusetts. That property was turned into a bed and breakfast museum of sorts. And Realtor.com has recommendations that buying a home where a murder happened might help you save some money. Usually the properties go for 15 to 50% less than the traditional asking price. So back in 1997, the Heaven's Gate cult led 39 people to kill themselves inside a San Diego mansion. That mansion was then sold for $668,000. That's about half what a property similar to that death mansion would fetch. Well, back in 2004, a woman named Carol Milner bought Jean Benet Ramsey's Boulder, Colorado home for a little over a million dollars. She told Inside Edition she wanted to restore the house and fill it with joy. Basically, you know, cleanse the property of the evil that occurred there. Now, I think the bank is probably grateful to unload the Chris Watts home, but it's not the only murder home to go up for sale recently. In Idaho, the home where the bodies of J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan were buried, well, it recently went up for sale and it is also under contract. All right, remember, Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell were both found guilty of the tragic religious murders of not only the two children, but also Chad's first wife, Tammy Daybell. She was found dead in her primary bedroom in that Salem, Idaho home. But that cell kind of has a slight twist. The owner of the property is Chad Daybell's lawyer, John Pryor. 
ownership of the home was transferred to Pryor in 2021. And Chad's daughter remained living in the home up until Chad's trial that ended in a guilty verdict in June of this year. You guys, that's a really quick leap. Guilty in June, on the market on June 27th, and it sold quickly. According to SFA Gate, the property was listed for $350,000 and it was placed under contract within hours. The sale is still pending and the buyer has not revealed themselves. I do know people in the area are hoping a philanthropist will purchase the property and that potentially the house and the outbuildings could be raised and a park or a memorial could be placed there instead. I'll be watching to see what happens to both of these properties. And let's file this next story under the what the heck was she supposed to do category. We're headed to Sonderborg, Denmark. And like many countries, Denmark is trying to manage an influx of asylum seekers. Immigrants who are declaring they are fleeing their home country and searching for a new place to put down roots. Now, it's a delicate balance for any government remaining humane enough to aid those in troubling circumstances while also protecting your current citizens. One way that Sonderborg has tackled the problem is to establish an asylum center. This is a place where asylum seekers can land until they find proper housing and work. But that center, filled with lots of single men, has created some issues while trying to solve other issues. In Sonderborg, in the last month, several females have reported being harassed in aggressive manners by male refugees housed at the asylum center. And this comes on the heels of a rising number of sex attacks by migrant gang members across many European countries. Now, because of the rise in sex attacks, several bars in Sonderborg are only accepting customers who speak Danish, German, or English. Now, those kinds of language requirements have been put in place in other establishments as well, usually after a migrant gang is seen harassing young adult women. Now, Denmark has been so concerned about the gangs that they are currently looking at a law that would seize the property of any asylum seeker, kind of as sort of a collateral, until the migrant establishes roots and employment and housing. So with that as a backdrop... Let's talk about this unnamed 17-year-old girl who was walking in the town of Sonderborg just a few weeks ago. She was approached by a man who, by the way, was English speaking, so the language enforcement wouldn't have helped this young woman in any way. Okay, so she's approached by a man who immediately tackles her to the ground and begins ripping her clothes from her body. But this girl was empowered and she had her pepper spray at the ready. She tagged her attacker with pepper spray and was able to get up and flee the situation. And she did what I would hope anyone listening would do. She reported the attack. But here's where it gets crazy. The authorities were not able to track down her attacker because he fled the scene, but they did have the young girl's story. And so they're charging her with a crime because in Denmark, it is illegal to possess and use pepper spray. Now, it will be a minor infraction and the fine will be minimal, but what's a girl supposed to do? And for me, I have one thing to say to Denmark. Maybe the law that makes owning and using pepper spray illegal should be nixed from the books. And one more thing, I'm super proud of you, 17-year-old girl. Way to fight back. And now this bizarre story that happened aboard an Alaska Airlines flight. And I just have one question. It doesn't seem like people can fly normally by air travel anymore. What's going on? Now, the answer to that question, when posed to a 75-year-old pastor from Virginia, is a big no. I can't normally fly through the air. I've got anger problems. Roger Holmberg and his wife, well, they were leaving on a flight from Seattle, Washington to Anchorage, Alaska. This was all in order to attend an event tied to his ministry. Well, as the two boarded the plane, witnesses allege that Roger... Okay, remember, he's a man of the cloth. Well, witnesses say that he became verbally abusive to his wife because she had been upgraded to first class, but his seat was in economy. When Robert started his verbal assault against his wife, he didn't realize that an off-duty police officer would see the entire spectacle. The witnesses told the FBI that Robert scolded his wife, asking her, how the hell did you get the upgrade? Well, she shot back that she was a Gold Point member and that he shouldn't speak to her like that. After that exchange, 
Roger allegedly struck his wife on the top of the head. Court records then indicate that there were at least two more aggressive maneuvers by Robert in the exchange. After smacking her again, he allegedly handed his phone to his wife and demanded that she read what was on the screen, and then he flipped off his wife. Well, another witness told the FBI investigators that while he was sitting in his assigned seat, Robert pushed past him and attempted to swing his arm toward his wife. The witness said he lifted his own arm to block Robert's arm, but he told investigators that he felt like Robert's hand still grazed the top of his wife's skull. When Robert's wife was interviewed, she said her husband had abused her previously. She claimed that back in September of 2023, Robert broke her finger during an argument between the two. Now, the wife admitted to investigators that her husband's knuckles had violently struck her during the flight. And then she told the authorities that she had been diagnosed with epilepsy and that that physical attack could have potentially caused her to have a seizure. She also said she had thought about reporting the abuse that happened in the past, but her fear caused her to keep the attacks to herself. Well... In a strange twist of fate, Robert's wife didn't have any noticeable abrasions on her head, but Robert did hurt his finger when he hit her, and he did have to have it bandaged during the flight. Well, following the flight, Robert told the authorities that he and his wife had known each other for 20 years, but had only been married for about one year. His first wife had passed on a little more than a year before he married his second wife. And he admitted that relationships weren't really his strong point, except he didn't take any of the blame. He allegedly stated to authorities that he had attended marriage counseling with his first wife in order to address her issues with anger and her propensity to, quote, be disrespectful to him. He also explained away his wife's broken finger back in September of 2023. He said he was driving, and while they were arguing in the car, his wife leaned over and aggressively grabbed his leg, which in turn hurt her finger. He also allegedly said his wife would grab his genitals to inflict pain on him. He then explained away his anger on the flight. He said he wasn't mad that she got an upgrade and that he didn't. He said he was mad that they couldn't sit by one another. And allegedly, he insisted that he did not hit his wife. He said he only tapped her on the head to get her attention. But the off-duty police officer told a different tell. He said that after Robert struck his wife on the head, that she said to him, you cannot be doing that. He said Robert turned away and walked to the bathroom facility in first class. After Robert returned to talk with his wife, the off-duty police officer told him that if he continued with his antics, that he would be cuffed for the remainder of the flight. Now, once they exited the plane, Robert was detained and eventually arrested after other witnesses gave statements about the abuse they saw Robert inflict on his wife. Robert has been charged with simple assault, and he spent one night in jail before he was released on his own recognizance. He could face up to three years in prison for the simple assault, and the federal courts will handle the case. Robert has been banned from all Alaska airline flights going forward. Okay, here's another just crazy twist to this story. I checked out a page on Facebook called Roger Allen Holmberg Fan Club. Okay, yes, that's what it's called. Roger Allen Holmberg Fan Club. In a post from August 30th of last year, so this was just weeks before his wife claimed that Roger injured her finger, someone moderating the page, maybe Robert, wrote that many Christians do not know the difference concerning the flesh and the spirit. Therefore, they live a life that is not pleasing to the Lord. All right, you guys, I've got nothing else. I just thought I would throw that out there. Best wishes to Roger's wife. And as always, hotline.org. It's the place to visit if you or someone you know is experiencing abuse. All right, let's finish with this quick update to the Karen Reed murder trial. Karen Reed's month-long trial for the murder of her boyfriend, John O'Keefe, ended in a mistrial about two weeks ago, when jurors were unable to reach a unanimous verdict. I've covered this trial multiple times here on Rise and Crime, and Peyton has an in-depth telling of the trial on her most recent Murder With My Husband episode. If you watch that one on YouTube, you'll see she recorded that episode from this studio. Well, now, Karen Reed's attorneys have filed a motion to dismiss two of the charges against her. They claim that a juror in the case came forward to attorney Alan Jackson. 
In the motion, it states that that juror said all 12 members unanimously voted to acquit Karen of John's murder and also of leaving the scene of a death. He said the juror said the only charge in question was that of manslaughter, which obviously would have held a much lighter sentence for the 44-year-old woman. Now, since the deadlock, prosecutors have vowed that they will retry the case that accused Karen of backing over her boyfriend, John O'Keefe, and leaving him to die outside of his friend and fellow law enforcement officer's home. Now, the filing by Jackson claims that since the jury was 12-0 for not guilty, the murder charge and also the charge of leaving the scene of an accident, well, he says those charges should be dismissed on account of double jeopardy. But it's not just Alan Jackson saying he talked to a juror. Another attorney for Karen named David Yanetti, well, he said he was contacted by two intermediaries who say they received information from two other jurors who also state that the jury was unanimous in their decision to acquit Karen on the murder charge. The prosecutors and defense attorneys meet again on July 22nd. At that hearing, they're going to determine a new trial date And those prosecutors have told the media they are looking forward to another trial. Judge Beverly Canone is reviewing the motion and will rule on it at a later and yet to be determined date. She did, however, order that all jurors' names be kept confidential. And last time we visited the case, I told you that Massachusetts State Police Trooper Michael Proctor had been relieved of his duties due to the inflammatory actions that were revealed in the Karen Reed trial. Now, Proctor was the lead investigator, even though he was good friends with Brian Albert, who owned the home where John O'Keefe died. While on the stand in the trial, Proctor admitted to sending text messages that called Karen names, and also those text messages referred to her as mentally unstable. He also was found to have said via text that he was disappointed he did not find any nudes in Karen's phone when he conducted a forensic audit of her personal information. Well, Boston 25 is now reporting that Proctor has officially been suspended without pay following a status hearing with the Massachusetts State Police Board. Okay, we're moving in degrees here. First, he was relieved of his duties, but he was still getting paid. Now he's suspended without pay. And legal expert Peter Ellicon told Boston 25 that by the July 22nd hearing, Proctor could be fired and charged criminally for his actions. Now, justice for John O'Keefe has not been met, which means we'll be revisiting this case again. I'll keep you updated. All right, that's your Thursday episode of Rise and Crime. You guys, thanks for joining me on Rise and Crime. I love being a part of your day. If you're loving the content, please share this show with a friend. And I love five-star reviews and positive comments. It really helps the podcast grow. And please like and follow on all of our social media and YouTube accounts that we have here at Oh No Media. You can join me again on Monday for more morning crime news. I'm Mama Jules, and keep safe out there.